afternoon and welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Kassidia Samuel, a program manager at the Rosa Luxemburg office in Dar es Salaam. Thank you all for joining us. This webinar is on record and the recording will be available on the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Berlin uh, office YouTube page. And if you need to share it with your colleagues later, it will be available hopefully in a week. Uh, we are also live on Facebook, so you can uh, call your friends to, to join in. Uh, please click the, uh, for translation, we have some translation. Uh, there's an icon below for translation. If you look uh, below at your screen, we have translation for German, English, and French. Uh, so please, uh, I hope you can find the uh, icon below on your screen. Uh, for your questions, please use the Q&A box, uh, which is also below. Or if you have a question or a comment, please go to that box. Uh, today we are talking trade, and uh, we have an exciting panel, which I'll be able to introduce later. We are going to discuss the Africa continent of free trade area in the context of other critical processes like the economic partnership arguments. Uh, which, as you all know, or you may be aware, remain largely inconclusive. We also have the post cotonou negotiations that are, uh, that are taking place. But also we are going to discuss the Africa continental free trade area in context of the current shifts in the global multilateral system. Uh, you all know there is a stalemate in the World Trade Organization. So we shall discuss this in the context of what is going on. To start us off, uh, we are delighted to have Honorable Maria Schreiber. Honorable Schreiber is a member of the Left Party in Germany, Die Linke, and she has been a member of Parliament since 2017. She is the chairperson of the Led Parliamentary Group in the Committee on Economic Cooperation and Development, and one of the focus of, of, of her office uh, 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 is uh, on, on privatization development uh, cooperation, among others. She's a critic of the neoliberal and has criticized approaches towards the South, including Africa. And she has worked on initiatives such as the Compact with Africa and the role of development uh, financial institutions in Africa. Her opening remarks will also address why it is important for us right now to have this discussion on the Africa continental free trade area but also to share our vision on the future uh, of the future economic relationship between Africa and Europe. Uh, Honorable Maria Schreiber, I invite you to take the stage of the platform for this case. Thank you very much. Bonjour, good morning and good morning, alle zusammen. Ich begrüße Sie und euch alle ganz herzlich zu unserem Webinar. Wenn EPAS das Problem sind, ist die afrikanische Freihandelszone die Lösung. Jetzt haben uns in den letzten Wochen einige Leute darauf hingewiesen, dass wir einen etwas sperrigen Titel für das Webinar gewählt haben. Aber ich denke, wir konnten dennoch gebührendes Interesse wecken. Denn die Diskussion, die wir heute führen, ist aus sehr vielen Gründen wichtig. Und ich möchte die kommenden Minuten dazu nutzen, etwas genauer auszuführen, warum. Erstens, die Beziehungen zwischen der Europäischen und der Afrikanischen Union, zwischen den europäischen und afrikanischen Ländern, die sind in Bewegung. Ende Oktober hätten am EU-AU-Gipfel Grundzüge einer neuen strategischen Partnerschaft zwischen den beiden Kontinenten diskutiert und verabschiedet werden sollen. Der Gipfel wurde zwar Corona-bedingt auf nächstes Jahr verschoben, mhm. doch die Debatten zu der Partnerschaft laufen ja weiter, im Hintergrund und langsamer. Ähnliches gilt für das post cotonou abkommen sowie die Zukunft der sogenannten wirtschaftlichen Partnerschaftsabkommen der EPAS, die bisher 14 afrikanische Staaten ratifiziert haben. Das kommende Jahr könnte also wichtige Entscheidungen für die zukünftigen wirtschaftlichen Beziehungen zwischen Afrika und Europa bringen. Und es ist höchste Zeit, darüber wieder mehr zu sprechen. Denn, und damit bin ich beim zweiten Punkt, eine kritische Begleitung der laufenden Verhandlungen zwischen den europäischen und afrikanischen Ländern findet derzeit kaum statt. 
Corona hat nicht nur diese Verhandlungen gebremst, es hat auch die kritische Begleitung und insbesondere einen internationalen vernetzten Austausch dazu nahezu zum Erliegen gebracht. Die Veranstaltung von WEMRO, dem Dachverband Deutscher Entwicklungsorganisationen, Mitte Oktober war eine wichtige Ausnahme. Das heutige Webinar, das in Kooperation mit Seatini Uganda, den Rosa-Luxemburg-Büros Dar es Salaam, Dakar und Brüssel sowie mit meinem Parteikollegen und Abgeordneten des Europaparlaments Helmut Scholz und von uns entwickelt worden ist, ist Teil des Versuchs, einen internationalen Austausch wieder stärker mit anzuschieben. Dieser Austausch ist umso wichtiger und damit bin ich bereits beim dritten Punkt, da in Afrika selbst ein, Gemeinschaft, ein gemeinsamer Wirtschaftsraum im Entstehen ist, die afrikanische Freihandelszone. Sollten die Pläne der Afrikanischen Union zu einer schrittweisen wirtschaftlichen Integration, mehr Freizügigkeit, ja eines Tages vielleicht sogar einer gemeinsamen Währung Realität werden, würde dies auch die wirtschaftlichen Beziehungen zu Europa verändern. Zugleich steht dieser panafrikanische Integrationsprozess in einem gewissen Spannungsverhältnis zu Handelsabkommen wie den EPAS, die den afrikanischen Kontinent in unterschiedliche Wirtschaftsblöcke teilt. Doch eine tiefergehende Auseinandersetzung mit der afrikanischen Freihandelszone findet in Deutschland und Europa bisher kaum statt. Das gilt, wie ich in Vorgesprächen zu der heutigen Veranstaltung erfahren habe, auch für große Teile der afrikanischen Öffentlichkeit. Hier wie da wird die afrikanische Freihandelszone in der Regel als panafrikanische Initiative begrüßt. Und ich glaube, das ist zu wenig. Natürlich unterstützen wir als Linke jede Initiative, die eine eigenständige und selbstgewählte Entwicklung der afrikanischen Länder und Volkswirtschaften zum Ziel hat. Und ja, ich wünsche mir, dass die afrikanische Freihandelszone dazu einen Beitrag leistet. Aber das ist keine ausgemachte Sache. Und warum nicht? möchte ich an zwei Punkten kurz klar machen. Der europäische Wirtschaftsraum, die Europäische Union, hat die eigenständige wirtschaftliche Entwicklung des Kontinents sicherlich gefördert. Die EU betreibt heute rund 60 Prozent des Handels mit sich selbst. Doch von der wirtschaftlichen Integration haben nicht alle Länder und Wirtschaftssektoren gleich profitiert. Vielmehr lässt sich ein Auseinanderdriften von Zentrum und Peripherie bemerken. Deutschland zählt definitiv zu den großen Gewinnern der europäischen Integration. Bei Ländern wie Griechenland oder Italien ist eine Einschätzung aber schon viel komplizierter. Radikal verändert hat die EU auch die Landwirtschaft in Europa. Diese ist heute zwar extrem wettbewerbsfähig, ein Großteil der Bäuerinnen und Bauern hat die wirtschaftliche Integration aber nicht überlebt. Die europäische Freihandelszone kennt also Gewinner und Verlierer. Und die afrikanische Freihandelszone? Welche Auswirkungen wird sie für die einzelnen Mitgliedstaaten und Wirtschaftssektoren haben? Und darüber müssen wir sprechen. Und mein zweites Bedenken gegen eine einfache, unkritische Unterstützung der Idee einer afrikanischen Freihandelszone, die entsteht ja nicht im luftleeren Raum. Die afrikanischen Länder sind durch unzählige Freihandelsabkommen bereits fest in die Weltwirtschaft und in globale Wertschöpfungsketten eingebunden und wie wir wissen auf sehr unvorteilhafte Weise. Und wie unter diesen Bedingungen ein panafrikanischer Wirtschaftsraum florieren soll, ist eine offene Frage. Klar ist, die zukünftige Gestaltung der europäisch-afrikanischen Wirtschaft Beziehungen, beispielsweise im Rahmen der EPAS, wird entscheidenden Einfluss darauf haben, ob und in welcher Form ein panafrikanischer Integrationsprozess gelingen kann. Und genau das ist auch der Grund, warum eine Debatte über die afrikanische Freihandelszone nicht nur in Afrika, sondern auch in Europa geführt werden muss. Wollen wir eine wirtschaftliche Integration zwischen den afrikanischen Staaten von Europa aus unterstützen, dann dürfen wir nicht nur wohlwollend auf die afrikanische Freihandelszone verweisen. Vielmehr müssen wir eine Debatte in Deutschland und Europa führen, wie wir unsere Handels- und Wirtschaftspolitik gegenüber den afrikanischen Ländern verändern müssen, um eine solche Integration zu ermöglichen. Es wird mich sehr freuen, wenn das heutige Webinar einen kleinen Beitrag zu einer solchen Debatte beisteuern könnte. Ich freue mich jedenfalls schon sehr auf die Beiträge und die Diskussion und übergebe wieder an Samuel Kasire, Mitorganisator und Moderator der heutigen Veranstaltung. Ihnen und euch allen wünsche ich eine spannende Veranstaltung.
Uh, thank you, Honorable Maria Schreiber. I think you are raising very critical points. Uh, I think the panelists will be able to expound on what you have said. Uh, first is the scrutiny of the negotiations. And on this platform, we also have a lot of journalists who want to report more on the Africa continental free trade area. And also civil society has faced a problem of scrutiny of these negotiations. Most of the time they are not uh, privy to the uh, text of these negotiations. So it has been hard. I think that is a critical point. Uh, thank you very much. I think we shall be able to expound on that. Uh, I would like to thank you for uh, opening this webinar. And I would like to thank your office, as well as the office of uh, Honorable Helmut Scholz, who will be a, a, a panelist today. We thank Siatini, uh, that is the Southern and Eastern Trade Information and Negotiations Institute in Uganda, the Rosal Luxemburg office in Berlin, Brussels, Dakar, and my colleagues here in Dar es Salaam. Uh, the webinar is uh, structured as follows. Uh, we shall have three panelists who will, I will introduce one by one. They'll all first present. Then we can uh, ask questions or have our comments as the uh, webinar goes on. Uh, first, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Ms. Jen Nalunga, who will be our first presenter. Jen Nalunga is currently the Executive Director of Siatini Uganda, a progressive Pan-African NGO working on trade and investment policy. She has more than 20 years of experience in research, in research analysis and advocacy, and has authored a number of policy-oriented studies and articles. She has closely followed the negotiations in the WTO, the Economic Partnership Agreements, and their implications on Africa. She's uh, a member of the official delegation to the World Trade Organization. This is, uh, she's a member of the Uganda delegation. She has observer status there and also has observer status with the Uganda delegation on the economic partnership agreements and other regional processes. Uh, so Jen, uh, your task today is to give us just a little brief about the Africa continent of free trade area the current state of play of the negotiations, uh, the pros and cons from a Southern and Eastern African perspective. Um, I'm very aware you have been very involved in these negotiations. So please, Jen, uh, you are welcome. Thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Sam, uh, for that very kind introdu introduction. Uh, good morning from Uganda, my fellow panelists and, um, and listeners. Um, as uh, Sam has pointed out, I'm just going to give um, a brief, uh, a brief, um, uh, a brief on the status of the CFTA. Um, and also give the pros and cons, and also give some proposals on, on the way forward. Um, I'll start with a genesis of uh, the CFTA. Um, when we look at issues around Africa unity and the formation of the African economic community, it goes back to Africa's struggles for independence and also the struggles for economic decolonization of Africa. Uh, these aspirations were translated into the Lagos Plan of Action for Economic Development, which was launched uh, between 1980 and 2000, and also they are clearly articulated in the Abuja Treaty. Um, the aspiration also for Africa's economic unity uh, is also clearly articulated in the formation of the Af Africa Union and, uh, and other initiatives uh, like uh, the one for having a continental uh, um, infrastructure, uh, uh, other initi initiatives around boosting of intra-Africa trade, and other initiatives. All these initiatives uh, are precursor uh, to the formation of 
for the CFTA. And there were also um, efforts to strengthen the regional economic communities like SADAC, the East African community, ECOWAS in East Africa. And these were to be used as the building blocks to the CFTA. It should also be noted as it has been um, articulated in Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, um, Africa's quest for structural transformation has also been clearly uh, articulated in that. So what I want to say is that the CFTA has roots within Africa. Um, the timelines. The CFTA negotiations were launched in 2016 and finalized in 2018. This is very critical to note, just two years. Uh, and the framework CFTA text was opened for signature uh, in March 2018 in Chigali. And at that summit, 44 AU member states signed the agreement. The other members signed later. Uh, the regional economic communities, like the East African community, ECOWAS in South Africa, ECOWAS in West Africa, were supposed to be the building blocks for the CFTA negotiation and implementation. And it was agreed. And it was agreed that by July 2020, trading will start, trading will start under the CFTA. So those were the timelines, very, very, um, uh, uh, very, very short timelines. Uh, the cu current state of play. Um, 54 African Union members out of five um, members have so far signed the consolidated text of the agreement. Um, only one country, Eritrea, hasn't yet signed. Uh, out of the 55 members, 30 members of the African Union have so far ratified. But what should be noted is that no single regional economic community has ratified the agreement. For example, in Uganda, in East Africa, Tanzania hasn't ratified and Burundi is yet to say, has a, they haven't ratified. Uh, in ECOWAS, for example, Nigeria hasn't ratified. So there is no single regional economic community which has ratified uh, the CFTA. Um, I will now look at the pending issues. At the Africa level, by September 2020, three custom unions, that's EAC, SADAC in, South, in the Southern region, ECOWAS in West Africa, are yet to submit their initial of draft offers. I, I want to go back to what's happening at the ESC level. At the ESC level, where I'm speaking from, um, the partner states are yet to, to discuss their, their schedules of tariff concessions and their schedules of uh, specific commitments on trading services. They are also yet to discuss and agree on rules of origin. So, so the ES member states are yet to submit their revised offers so that they are consolidated and harmonized into an ESC offer, which they will submit to the AU. That hasn't been, been done. Therefore, when you look at the deadline, 
you know, the timelines, the new timelines now, as per now, is that trading under the CFTA arrangement is to commence on 1st January 2021, which is very, very unrealistic. Um, I will now go to uh, the challenges. Um, one of the challenges facing the CFTA, the CFTA negotiations, is the COVID, as the uh, previous speaker pointed out. COVID has been a challenge. Um, but for us in the region, there has also been limited capacity of countries to negotiate online. You know, we have so many challenges, like now we are having challenges, you know, connections, weak internet, so there are challenges of negotiating online. Although the African Union was insisting that negotiations should be uh, undertaken online. There is also the challenge of technical capacity of the RICs to negotiate. In fact, a number of countries and regional economic groupings have requested for uh, technical capacity to be able to undertake meaningful negotiations. There are also other ongoing negotiations. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the EU, e, EU ESA EPA. EU, the ESA region, the East Africa, East and Southern African region are negotiating a deep EPA with the EU. Uh, this is very, very problematic because the deep EPA is putting on table issues like investment, competition, government procurement, which go beyond what we have agreed on in the WTO but which also we subscribe what we are going to negotiate in the CFTA because these are issues which have been pushed under the CFTA in the second phase of the negotiation. You know, so this is also a, a challenge. There are also the global compact with Africa, which is where uh, Germany is negotiating with just a few, a few compact countries. There is also the US Kenya FTA. So, so Africa is also, there are the ongoing negotiations which are making negotiations under the CFTA a bit uh, challenging. Um, who are the demanders of the CFTA? I wanted to, I don't know whether I should discuss that later when it comes to the demanders and the winners. Should I, Africa? Um, uh, Sam? Yes, I think, Jen, I think that that is also part of the question that has come. Maybe you can address this later in the, in the Q&A session. Uh, mm. Okay, so we discuss later the issue of the demanders and who are the winners and who are the losers. But maybe I will uh, I will make my conclusion and also uh, give some uh, proposals on the way on the way forward. Um, my conclusion really is that when it's critical to make the CFTA meaningful and beneficial to all AU members, Africa Union members, and also to all Africa citizens. And when we talk about Africa citizens, we are looking at MSMEs, the smallholder farmers, the women in the rural areas, the cross-border women traders. It has to be beneficial. To, to those people. And we also need to ensure that the CFTA achieve the long-standing African aspiration for structural transformation. And as a way forward, as Africa, we need to balance the political aspiration, but also the technical realities on the ground. We have seen politics 
dominating the CFT. The timelines are very, very unrealistic. And we haven't given enough time to the technical negotiations. The timelines are very unrealistic. So as a way forward, we are looking at proposing that the timelines, they should be addressed. Then also the involvement of the stakeholders. Today, it's a, a preserve of government. You know, the private sector is not involved. MSM is um, not involved. Uh, civil society is not involved. So it's, uh, uh, that, that, that's a very critical issue as we move forward. Another issue is also balancing the issue of liberalization and the production, productive capacity of Africa. Um, the CFT has concentrated so much on liberalization. When you look at the, the proposals for liberalization, they are very unrealistic. And if we, we don't have our own products to trade, that means we are going to trade products from outside. You know, so we need also to rethink the liberalization and also balance it with uh, productivity. Then lastly, we need also to balance the interests of the smaller countries and the interests of the bigger, the bigger countries. When you look at the liberalization schedule, countries like Uganda will not survive they will not survive, they will not be able to compete. So that balancing of the poor, in fact, the CFTA document talks about the hegemonies, but they don't look at practically how to balance the interests of the hegemonies and the interests of the, uh, the smaller economies. So I will stop there and I'll, I will look at the other issues after the discussions. So thank you so much, over to you, Sam. Uh, thank you very much, Jen. I think you have summarized it very well, especially looking at uh, the aspirations we have for structural transformation, and then how we go about it with deep uh, liberalization. Uh, I think uh, uh, the questions are coming in on this. And uh, for the next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Ndongo Sila Samba. I think he's going to look at the economic assumptions of, of, of the Africa continental free trade area. So he's going to extend on the ideological kind of assumptions and, and, and data of what Jen has been uh, trying to, 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 to talk about. Um, Dr. Samba is a Senegalese development economist he is currently a research and program manager at the West Africa office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. His publications cover topics such as fair trade, labor markets in developing countries, social movements, democratic theory, and he has written a number of books and co-authored a number of books. I have some copies here. I don't know if he can tell us more where to, to, to uh, uh, find them. Uh, so, Sila, you have been a critic of the Africa continental free trade area, at least the economic assumptions of, of, of it. So please give us uh, your presentation on this and what you think of the initiative. Thank you very much. <coughs> Merci beaucoup, Sam. Et bonjour à tous et à toutes. Uh, C'est un grand plaisir d'être uh, parmi vous uh, ici aujourd'hui. Donc, ma présentation sera brève et tournera, comme Sam l'a dit, autour des hypothèses économiques derrière, euh, disons, la défense du projet de zone de libre-échange continentale. Et donc, il faut dire dès le départ que la zone de libre-échange continentale a très peu fait l'objet de débats en Afrique. Et, et euh, d'ailleurs, elle est plutôt bien vue par, la, par les rares Africains qui sont au courant de son existence. Euh, comment peut-on expliquer l'absence de discours critique sur la zone libre-échange continentale africaine, y compris de la part des intellectuels panafricanistes et des intellectuels de gauche de manière générale À mon avis, il y a deux présuppositions critiques qui, ex qui existent là 
Et il est important de passer en revue préalablement ces deux prépositions critiques, présuppositions critiques, afin de pouvoir faire entrevoir les risques et dangers potentiels de la ZLECA pour les pays africains. La première présupposition est que la ZLECA est une initiative panafricaniste et qu'elle se situerait dans la droite lignée, disons, de la vision des pères fondateurs du panafricanisme, comme le président ghanéen Kwame Krumah. La deuxième présupposition est que le libre-échange entre les pays africains n'est pas nuisible. On peut critiquer les accords de partenariat économique parce que c'est le libre-échange entre l'Afrique et les pays européens. Ça, ça peut être nuisible, mais entre Africains, le libre-échange est tout à fait bénéfique. Et d'ailleurs, le libre-échange pourrait permettre aux pays africains de répondre aux au défis de leur développement. Par exemple, au-delà de l'augmentation du commerce intra-africain, le libre-échange pourrait augmenter la croissance économique, industrialiser l'Afrique et créer des emplois en masse. C'est comme ça que la zone libre-échange est vendue. Et donc, la première présupposition qu'il faudrait un peu démystifier, c'est est-ce euh, que la zone libre-échange continentale est une initiative panafricaniste qui se situe dans la droite lignée de la vision des figures du panafricanisme, comme quoi micro-moins. La réponse qui peut paraître surprenante est non. La zone libre-échange continentale n'est pas une initiative panafricaniste. Pourquoi Parce que dans la vision originelle des panafricanistes, comme le président Ghanéen Kwame Krumah et des intellectuels comme le Sénégalais Cheikh Antadjo, l'intégration économique, commerciale et monétaire doit être nécessairement précédée de l'intégration politique. Sans le préalable de l'intégration politique, le projet panafricaniste ne peut aller bien loin. Uh, Cheikh Antetjoub, l'intellectuel sénégalais, uh, dans une interview de 1977, disait cela très clairement. La CDAO, qui est la Communauté économique des États de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, ECOWAS en anglais, a été créée en 1976-1975. Il a été interviewé dans ce contexte-là. Et il disait que la CDAO est une forme d'intégration bancale sur laquelle il ne se faisait aucune illusion parce qu'on ne peut pas concevoir l'intégration économique sans le préalable de l'intégration politique. Et donc, pourquoi l'intégration politique doit-elle précéder l'intégration économique euh, Il y a cela plusieurs raisons. Euh, tout d'abord, euh, parce que cela permet euh, la paix au sein du continent et ça permet aussi au continent d'assumer sa propre défense. Euh, la deuxième chose, c'est que l'intégration politique permet d'avoir une voix africaine unique sur la scène internationale. Ainsi, par exemple, les pays africains pourront coordonner la vente de la marché première à des prix stables et rémunérateurs qui leur permettront de financer leur industrialisation et aussi euh, de profiter des euh, économies d'échelle. Euh, cette industrialisation euh, serait menée à l'échelle du continent et non pays par pays. Ce n'est pas le Kenya, le Sénégal ou l'Ouganda qui euh, s'industrialiseraient euh, chacun euh, côte à côte. Donc l'industrialisation serait planifiée en fonction des ressources, des complémentarités et des avantages des uns et des autres. Et enfin, cette intégration nécessairement va créer des gagnants et des perdants. Mais les perdants ne vont pas, être, ne vont pas se détourner du projet panafricaniste parce que l'intégration politique permettra en fait de compenser les perdants parce qu'il y aura un cadre politique, démocratique et collégial qui permettra la prise en charge de ce type de questions. Et donc c'est grosso modo ceci qui constitue le modèle d'intégration panafricaniste à la Croma, à la Chère Antidio, etc. Et donc, il y a au moins trois différences majeures entre cette vision panafricaniste originelle et le projet de zone libre-échange continentale, qui est pour moi euh, une démarche afro-libérale. Et donc, euh, la première différence, c'est que l'intégration politique euh, est censée être une conséquence de l'intégration par les marchés, selon la ZLECA. Euh, la deuxième différence, c'est qu'en fait, il n'y a pas de planification à l'échelle du continent dans le cadre de la, de la ZLECA. Ce sont les marchés, c'est-à-dire les entreprises privées, les monopoles, qui déterminent le volume à la direction des flux commerciaux. Donc, ça veut dire qu'il n'y a pas de planification euh, par les États, par la politique, alors que les pays africains vont se voir progressivement euh, euh, dépourvus de leurs outils de politiques commerciales et industrielles. Donc, ça veut dire que c'est la main invisible du marché qui va créer une industrialisation spontanée euh, au sein du continent. La troisième différence majeure, c'est qu'il n'y a pas de mécanisme généralisé à l'échelle continentale pour compenser les perdants. Euh, dans le cas des accords de partenariat économique, les APE, euh, l'Union européenne avait même fait semblant de dire qu'il y aurait une forme de compensation euh, pour les euh, pays africains parce qu'il y aurait des pertes prévisibles de recettes douanières. 
Mais dans le cas de la zone libre-échange continentale, il n'y a pas de mécanisme de compensation prévu euh, à ma connaissance. Donc, par rapport à ce premier point, je dirais euh, pour conclure que la zone de libre-échange continentale euh, repose sur une logique d'intégration et de planification par les marchés dans, le, dans un contexte où les États sont progressivement dépourvus de leurs instruments de politique industrielle et commerciale. Tandis que dans la vision panafricaniste, euh, l'intégration repose sur une coordination politique et une planification économique à l'échelle du continent qui entrevoit euh, une forme de compensation pour les perdants. Et donc, la deuxième question qu'il faudrait euh, aborder et le deuxième, en, en tout cas, mythe qu'il faudrait un peu détruire, c'est que euh, le libre-échange euh, peut permettre aux pays africains de répondre à leurs défis de développement. Grâce au libre-échange, le commerce entre, entre pays africains va augmenter, les pays africains vont s'industrialiser et créer des emplois en masse. Et donc, ce qu'il faut dire tout d'abord, c'est qu'en fait, dans le cadre de la théorie économique, comme ce qu'on a vu aussi dans la littérature empirique, il n'y a aucune raison, euh, a priori, pour que le libre-échange augmente la croissance économique. Ça, c'est un résultat euh, important qui a été mis en évidence par les travaux empiriques. Euh, euh, les travaux empiriques n'ont pas été en mesure de démontrer que les épisodes de libéralisation commerciale ont permis d'augmenter la croissance. Ça, il faut, il faut, il faut le comprendre. Euh, la deuxième chose, c'est que l'argument pour le libre-échange n'est pas un argument euh, consistant à dire que le libre-échange va stimuler la croissance ou créer le développement. Pas du tout. L'argument pour le libre-échange, selon ses partisans, c'est qu'il augmente l'efficience. C'est-à-dire que grâce au libre-échange, les coûts des entreprises vont diminuer et d'une certaine manière, cette diminution des coûts pourra être répercutée sur les consommateurs. Or, pour que le libre-échange favorise l'efficience, il y a plusieurs conditions qui doivent être remplies. Euh, par exemple, il ne doit pas y avoir de chômage ou de sous-emploi. Euh, avec la libéralisation commerciale, les entreprises doivent pouvoir ajuster leur production aux demandes du marché international du jour au lendemain. Par exemple, si une entreprise exportait 1000 tonnes de coton et qu'il y ait maintenant la libéralisation et que le marché international réclame 10 000 tonnes, cette entreprise du jour au lendemain doit pouvoir, euh, disons, exporter les 10 000 tonnes de coton. Euh, la, une troisième condition, c'est qu'il existe des mécanismes d'assurance pour les producteurs. Euh, une autre condition, c'est que les perdants de la libéralisation commerciale vont être compensés. Et enfin, une dernière condition, c'est que cette compensation peut être mise en œuvre sans impliquer aucun coût. Donc, euh, si ces cinq hypothèses ne sont pas remplies, donc, le, la, en fait, la présupposée dé, déficience ne sera pas remplie. Euh, donc, le libre-échange ne va pas générer euh, l'efficience. Et donc, euh, évidemment, toutes ces hypothèses ne sont remplies nulle part, pas même dans les pays riches et a fortiori dans les pays les plus pauvres. Mais ce que beaucoup ignorent, euh, les journalistes, les organisations de la société civile, etc., c'est que tous les travaux de simulation des impacts économiques de la ZLECA reposent sur de telles hypothèses et d'autres encore beaucoup plus délirantes. Euh, par exemple, tous les travaux qui ont été produits jusque-là par l'Union africaine euh, et par la Banque mondiale pour défendre les biens fondés économiques de la ZLECA repose sur l'hypothèse de plein emploi des ressources, l'hypothèse que la perte des recettes douanières ne va pas réduire les dépenses publiques et donc ne va pas réduire la croissance économique, euh, l'hypothèse que les déficits commerciaux des pays africains vont pouvoir se résorber automatiquement grâce à la flexibilité des taux de change et donc l'endettement extérieur en monnaie étrangère ne pose aucun problème. Et donc, nous avons vu circuler euh, euh, l'information selon laquelle la mise en œuvre de la zone libre-échange continentale va augmenter le commerce intra-africain de 50%. En fait, peu d'entre nous euh, sont au courant que ce chiffre a été produit à partir des données très anciennes, très rudimentaires et avec des extrapolations sans fondement. Euh, Jacques Berstelot, qui, qui est là, qui nous suit dans le public, a fait un commentaire très utile sur toutes ces questions-là. Euh, par conséquent, euh, quand les gens ordinaires pensent que la zone libre-échange continentale va apporter plus de développement, en fait, ils se trompent lourdement. Euh, Est-ce qu'il est même naïf, en fait, de se demander si la zone libre-échange continentale va aider l'Afrique à sortir du sous-développement? Car les travaux euh, qui justifient le bien fondé économique euh, de la zone libre-échange continentale partent de l'hypothèse que l'Afrique n'a pas de problème de développement. Donc, il faut bien comprendre cela. Il n'y a pas de chômage, il n'y a pas de problème de balance des paiements. L'Afrique n'a pas de problème de développement. Et c'est à partir de là qu'on justifie les biens fondés du libre-échange. Donc, quand je dis cela, beaucoup pourraient être 
surpris et se dire comment il serait possible que des institutions sérieuses comme l'Union africaine, la Banque mondiale, etc., puissent cautionner de tels travaux. En fait, ceci reflète l'état, disons, de la science économique, l'économie dominante néoclassique. En fait, pour justifier les vertus d'efficience du marché, il ne faut pas se refuser les hypothèses les plus incroyables qui soient. Et donc, malheureusement, les institutions communautaires en fait, sont dominés par l'économie conventionnelle. Les gouvernements africains sont conseillés par des économistes orthodoxes, et ce qui explique qu'il y ait ce biais pour le libre-échange. Et donc, le dernier point que je voudrais évoquer rapidement est que les travaux pour le libre-échange, qui justifient le libre-échange, malgré leurs hypothèses incroyables et les limitations des données sur lesquelles ils s'appuient, génèrent souvent des résultats qui sont à porte-à-faux avec les rhétoriques libre-échangistes. Euh, un premier exemple, c'est une étude de Simon Mevel et Stéphane Karingi qui a été publiée en 2012. En fait, cette étude-là euh, conclut que les pays importateurs nets de produits alimentaires... Don't go, uh, please. Les, les, les pays importateurs nets de produits euh, alimentaires comme l'Angola, la République démocratique du Congo, le Mozambique, euh, la, le Botswana, les pays d'Afrique du Nord, les, le Nigeria, de manière générale, tous ces pays vont perdre au libre-échange parce que leurs revenus vont diminuer. Euh, et l'étude même conclut qu'en fait, près de la moitié des pays africains vont perdre au libre-échange. Mais malgré tout, la conclusion, c'est que le libre-échange, entre guillemets, va bénéficier au continent. Une étude plus récente de la Banque mondiale a été publiée récemment au début de l'année. Euh, cette étude en fait, indique également que la ZLECA ne va pas faire augmenter la taille du secteur industriel dans le PIB, produit intérieur brut. En fait, euh, la part de, du secteur industriel dans le PIB euh, doit diminuer dans 18 des 24 pays euh, euh, étudiés par la, par, la, par la Banque mondiale. Donc, pour conclure, en fait, il y a trois choses qu'il faut retenir. C'est que la ZLECA est vendue comme une initiative panafricaniste, ce qu'elle n'est pas. Elle relève plutôt de l'afro-libéralisme. La deuxième conclusion, c'est que la ZLECA est vendue comme un projet qui va permettre au continent de se développer, alors que les travaux de simulation sans se justifier sont bien fondés, partent de l'hypothèse que l'Afrique n'a pas de problème de développement. Et la troisième conclusion, c'est que les travaux sans se justifier les bien fondés euh, économique de la ZLECA, malgré leur manque de rigueur et les hypothèses incroyables sur lesquelles ils reposent, montrent que les perdants seront nombreux et que l'industrialisation et les emplois ne seront pas au rendez-vous. Je précise que cette critique n'a pas pour objet de dire que l'Afrique ne doit pas s'intégrer sur le plan commercial et que la réduction des entraves à la liberté de circulation des biens et des personnes est une mauvaise chose en soi. Cette critique a plutôt pour objet d'ouvrir une discussion sur les alternatives pouvant être explorées quand on sort du carcan de l'économie orthodoxe. Merci beaucoup. Um, Dong, thank you very much. Uh, you've taken a little bit of time, but it has been very exciting. Uh, and what I get from there is uh, two main points. Is first, we should be integrating, uh, integrating production instead of trade, because we have not integrated up production, but we are integrating trade and liberalizing trade. Then the other is on political integration. I think what you are proposing is an inverted uh, kind of uh, 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 approach where we start with uh, political federation instead of economic uh, uh, federation. federation. Uh, we do not have a lot of time, we're running out of time. Uh, so let me quickly introduce our third speaker, who is Honorable Helmut Scholz, who is a member of the European Parliament, where he has served since 2009 as a coordinator for the Confederation Group of European United Left and Nordic Green Left, which brings together left-wing members of Parliament in the European Union. He is a member of the Committee on International Trade, He's also the vice chair of the U European Parliament's Fair Trade Working Group, where he has successfully uh, been in charge of promoting an establishment of the City of the Fair and Ethical Trade Award. Um, he is also uh, a, a EU's Parliament Standing Rapporteur for, for, environmental, for the Environmental Goods Argument. He's also an active member of the Parliamentarians uh, for Global Action. 
as well as the global interparliamentary network of representatives worldwide supporting the UN binding treaty on business and human rights. I know many people here who are working on the uh, UN uh, business and human rights treaty. So uh, we have a good resource here. And today, um, Honorable Helmut is going to, 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 to discuss if the African continent of free trade area is discussed in the European Parliament, and if it is, how is it uh, discussed in the European Parliament? And also, he'll give a discussion on, on, on the comprehensive strategy uh, for Africa. Uh, Honorable Scholz, you're welcome. You have 10 minutes. I hope you can be able to wrap up within 10 minutes. You're welcome. Thank you very much, um, Samuel, for uh, this opportunity. And I want to thank the organizers for this very timely and um, very um, challenging um, um, seminar or workshop. And it is a very uh, interesting and important topic which deserves all the attention, not only of us, probably coming from a left, from a from a from a background rethinking trade cooperation between the European Union and um, the African continent, uh, with all the uh, regions, uh, with the different political stakeholders, economic stakeholders, in. and so um, I want to uh, say uh, frankly that um, I'm more or less uh, interested in listening to all your experience, your um, judgments about the challenges ahead of us. Uh, let me start at the beginning that, um, um, as Eva Maria has said in the beginning, uh, that the title of our workshop is a little bit not so easy sound, sounding, but I would say uh, I like it because it's provocative. Uh, and um, as a left-wing politician in the European Parliament, one is tempted to shout out, "Spetenius, of course, no, uh, and to lean back and rely on the many books critical of neoliberal free trade agreements, which have been, which you all have been reading and to an extent even writing ourselves and yourselves. And to be honest with you, when the ACFTA is mentioned in the Committee on International Trade in the European Parliament. This happens indeed in the context of classical trade policies, as it is already characterized by the speakers um, before me uh, this morning. The EU Commission considers the endeavor to form an all-African uh, free trade area as an important step towards market liberalization. And they say they supported it from the beginning logistically and financially. And probably we all agree that it is without doubt that we know that there is, of course, an investment in going into this direction um, in, the, in the understanding of the neoliberal free trade logic. Uh, the European Union is still um, practicing uh, for the time being, as it is probably a long way there, the Commission still relies on the EPAs that have been concluded. Sabine Weyan, the new Director General of the DG Trade, expressed her hope that one day there could be a region-to-region -region free trade agreement built on the current EPAs as stepping stones. And frankly speaking, the DG Trade, Jane knows it maybe very concrete and explicitly also from her experiences and uh, accompanying the negotiations round in the WTO is not the most progressive department in the European Commission. For decades, the civil servants of the uh, or in the DG trade measured their success to work by growth rates for Europe and increase profit for companies based in Europe. And they were successful in this regard. You have spoken about that already with your experiences. And every single FTA concluded by the EU led to a change in the balance of trade to the benefit of Europe. And yet, and it must also be taken into account that these negoti negotiated agreements with sub-partner countries in this regional uh, trade agreements had given them a chance to gain profit or benefits 
for parts of their societies compared with those in other countries of the same region. So for example, the East African uh, community IPA is of course leading to more benefits for some stakeholders in Kenya or in, um, in Rwanda compared with Burundi or Tanzania, etc. So we are creating by this IPA, the regional IPA, also a disparity in the region itself. What I'm working for is opening chances and realities to achieve in the shifting of the paradigm for measuring success. And we need agreements, and I hope that we can agree here, that help to achieve an advancement of our societies. I suggest building on something that has already been achieved. All our governments have agreed on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and our ministries should feel obliged to achieve these goals by 2030. That is, I think, how we should measure success. And how this trade policy, how has that health policy, or how has that competition policy and labor policy contributing, um, contributed to achieving the SDGs by this year 2030? And probably we have to rethink also the relationship between the parliaments, the civil society representatives, the regional uh, structures and organizations to control their ministers when they are negotiating agreements, etc. So that this measurement becomes transparent and understandable in the society themselves. We all know that Africa, EU Africa trade has been characterized by for years, decades centuries, inequality and unfair trade relations. And um, knowing this, I have to think two things to do in the European Parliament, and probably not me alone, but uh, left and, and, and progressive-minded people, and also those who are critical in the state of play where we are, that we have to find a new approach and to make it possible, realistic, basis for the current policies, uh, which is ending traditional exploitation. And uh, as a business in Europe, as business in the United States, business in Canada, Japan or China, continues always to talk about the right to access to raw materials in African soil. And in particular, when it comes to the so-called strategic resources, many in Europe are willing to use all means necessary to secure supply. So this is a concrete challenge, what we have to take up on the, on the surface of our desk in our, in our societies to make it understandable for everybody uh, what is on the stake. Vis-a-vis -vis Africa, I have to learn to listen, as I already said. What are African proposals to break the circle of poverty? Which avenue is in your mind when you are pursuing the African um, uh, CFTA? Is it the pan-African nature, as it has just been said, of this project that will help you to break free from the dependence on exports to Europe and the US and China? So the political integration is really an interesting point of discussion, and we should try to uh, to go uh, even this morning deeper into this uh, reality. And there are very, I see that there are very interesting elements in what the African Union has decided with regard to the different phases, phases of establishing the AFC CFDA. Let me take, for instance, the aspect of free movement of people. We know it from Europe. In 2018, the African Union, in its protocol to the treaty establishing the African Economic Community relating to the free movement of persons, right of residence and right of establishment, outlined a set of general rules to facilitate mid-migration between the African Union member states. And in particular, this protocol noted that the free movement of persons in Africa will facilitate the establishment of the continental free trade area endorsed by the EU. But will this provide us with an avenue to end the suffering of so many millions of migrants on both on our uh, continents? From a European standpoint, 
the main preoccupations are with the irregular migration towards Europe, while for Africa, issues to do with continental free trade and free circulations are central. Today, and then we are coming back to the, to the point which I mentioned by, by, by the approach from the European Union to keep on the economic um, uh, dependence. Today, more than 50% of uh, African migrants in OECD countries are from the north of Africa. More than 75% of sub-Saharan migrants stay in other African countries. Nobody is speaking more or less in Europe about that. Can we develop and organize a relationship between the people on our continent, which goes beyond a free trade agreement and that can accommodate migration, including rights and respect. Uh, not to be too long, it seems to me to be still a long way to go, but it is so important to look at trade area, not only from the perspective of a merchant, from commercial interests. And by the way, this is something I'm also telling to half of the British people who wants to relate to the rest of Europe only in strictly business relationship. And we, we have learned what the Brexit means for the relationship between people at the European continent. The European Union is also an example that any deeper economic integration must be paralleled by social, environmental and regulatory integration. A comprehensive understanding of cooperation needs in the Union is essential for achieving social economic cohesion. But the European Union is also an example for a single market which has been benefiting advanced economies and strong and large companies more than others. Eva Maria has spoken about that in the morning in her introductory remarks. People in Bulgaria and Romania, for example, did not see a strong increase in their wages after joining the European Union. Chinese workers earn today, in the meantime, more and better as a result of their Chinese inclusive growth model. There's a lot of internal migration from Central and Eastern European states to the West and to the North. Finally, we now have a proposal on the table for European minimum wage system. So tell me how you are going to develop the African Union and your AF, AFCFTA, how will you avoid disproportionate, disproportionate benefits uh, for ShopRite supermarkets from South Africa, for Nigerian oil billionaires, or one and experts in financial services? So, I mean, the reality of the economic um, um, disparity in, 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 in our, also in the African societies in, in different countries is of course a challenge, a big challenge uh, to you and uh, probably also to all of us. Will social justice, will protecting the climate, will labor rights, will democracy, will transparency, will the achievements of the SDGs offer guiding principles for Africa's economic transition? And here I see the big responsibility also from the European Parliament, from, econo from economic, political, social, civil society stakeholder from the European continent to support you in discussing these questions, to contribute our experiences into the reality of the today's uh, development. And by that, giving us a chance to rethink also the, the whole uh, concept and the uh, issues. And finally, uh, we have adopted uh, in, in October, even under the COVID-19, uh, challenges in a, um, in a um, remote procedure of the European Parliament, um, the, the positioning of the European Parliament concerning the African strategy of the European uh, Commission. So there is, uh, there is something on the table where a lot of, as you know, it is a compromise between the different wings in the European Parliament, but where we are offering certain uh, new ideas to, to accompany that we want really a, a change in the strategy of the European Commission, of the European Union member states, the Council, and at the national level towards the African continent, and uh, that it is clear that the African continent's strategic importance and the need to strengthen the partnership 
uh, with and not for Africa should offer new approaches. But maybe we are discussing it now uh, later on. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Honorable Helmut, for that uh, detailed uh, presentation. And I think you have raised the point about hegemony, uh, which Jen had earlier alluded to. Uh, we have, in our case, we have a South African hegemony, Nigerian, and then an Egyptian uh, hegemony because they are the big brothers in Africa. And then I would like to connect this to a question that has come into Jen. If we have such a hegemony, who are the winners and the losers? And how is this hegemony being treated within the Africa continental free trade area? Please, Jane, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Sam. And thank you so much to uh, Celia and to uh, Honorable Helmut. The issues they have raised are very, very critical. Um, uh, who are the winners? and who are the losers, and who are those people who are demanding for the CFTA. Um, because the winners, are, again, are the people who are demanding now for the CFTA. So we start with the demanders of the CFTA. Um, and what we have to note that African states and African people do want the CFTA because it's a normal progression of the Africa people's aspiration for African unity and for structural transformation. And that's a fact that the African people want a CFTA, but not in its current form. Um, the demanders of the current CFTA are called the Afro-champions. And these are the big businesses like Equity Bank, the Eco Bank Group, and we know they are interested in the parliament system. Uh, we have such groups like the Dangote, the Dangote Group, uh, the African Airline Corporation, who want an open African sky. So, so we see big business being interested in the current CFTA, which is about opening up uh, the continent. Another group of uh, um, uh, people demanding for the CFTA are the political heavyweights who want to be seen they want to be seen supporting African integration agenda and who want to be seen as pan-Africans, uh, Africanists. I won't mention their names, but we know them. Uh, they, are, they are also the technical arm, people who are, who are working in the AU, who want to finish their assignment. Uh, but we also have negotiators who have put in a lot of money and resources in these negotiations. Um, they are for the people demanding for the CFTA and putting on table very unrealistic deadlines and not the small scale producers, not the MSMEs, you know, but those groups of people. So who are going, going to be the winners? The winners, again, are going to be the big businesses. And the losers, like Sarah pointed out, are going to be the small and the fragile economies. The MSMEs, the small scale producers, the fisher folks, the workers, those are the people who are going to be losers. So um, we need to rethink uh, the CFTA. But what I also want to, uh, to point out, there is uh, some on the chat, some people have been asking that the CFTA is an African initiative. So what's wrong with it? Um, the CFTA is truly an African initiative, but it's just a tool mm, which we need to, to modify to suit the challenges facing the continent. You know? so, so we need to ensure that the design 
of the CFTA works for the people. So it isn't enough to say that just because it's uh, an African initiative, it's good, uh, it's good for the continent. So I'll stop there, Sam. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. Um, we have uh, two questions here, and uh, they are addressed to Ndongo. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, some people want to know about a West African uh, perspective because uh, uh, they are signed EPS uh, between, uh, by Ghana and uh, Ivory Coast. And how do they constitute uh, genuine hurdles for the implementation? That is the first question. But there is uh, here, if I can read a more, uh, uh, a more interesting question here. Uh, do you think that the continental free trade area could help uh, support the disconnection of Africa from the world economy uh, as supported by uh, Samir Amin? So those are the two questions for you. I hope you can address them within five minutes. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you very much, Sam. I start by the second question about uh, whether the AFCFTA is a tool to help Africa delink. And when we say delinking, it's not autarky, but uh, rebalancing of uh, domestic and external relationships. I myself asked the question to Samir Amin uh, two years ago. I went to his office and I interviewed him. I said, Samir, yeah, I am. I don't feel that the AFCFTA is a good initiative for Africa. And I think I am alone um, thinking like that. He told me, I share the same uh, opinion uh, with you. Uh, because when you have free trade zone, they will have enterprises uh, which will insert on the coastal zones and the entire countries like the poorest one, uh, like the Republic of Central Africa, Niger, Chad, etc. They will not benefit from, from that. He said, I am against free trade zones. So the, the um, answer from Samir Amin itself is that the AFCFTA is not a tool for delinking. That, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, trade integration is not a good thing for Africa, but that only implies that we could have other mechanisms of trade integration. For example, in West Africa, we know that um, from 20 to 65 percent of the imports of countries are devoted to just uh, two items, food products and energy products. I think African countries could do their best to achieve food and energy self-sufficiency. It's not clear how free trade could help African countries obtain um, food, food sovereignty and uh, energy uh, sovereignty. But with other forms of integration, it's possible. Uh, to, say with, uh, to stay with uh, West Africa, yes, the situation is complicated because uh, two countries, uh, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, have signed uh, interim EPAs uh, with the European Union. And in, the, in those interim EPAs, there is this clause of uh, most private nation. And uh, normally, they granted 80% of tariff liberalization to the European Union. Whereas in the framework of the African continental free trade area, it is expected uh, that uh, the trade liberalization will cover 90% uh, of Thai plants. That means that Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire will have to extend the same, uh, let's say, preferences to, to the European Union. And one of the consequences is that uh, normally uh, this could not be uh, handled within the, the ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, as they normally belong to a custom union. And in the framework of the CFTA, this is a huge hurdle. I myself asked the question uh, last November to a trade commissioner uh, in, in ECOWAS, Economic Community of West Africa, said, they told me we are negotiating, but this is a huge issue. And for now, it's, it's a fail mate. We don't know how to deal with that. So it's a question we'll have to follow, but it's sure that African countries have to have a common policies uh, regarding how they will uh, deal with such kind of trade arguments like the EPAs. Thank you very much, Ndongo. I have other questions for you, but they will come in the uh, second session of this plenary. 
Uh, the next question goes to Honorable Helmut Shaw. Uh, one question has come in is about the economic partnership agreements. How are they being treated now? Being that uh, they remain inconclusive, uh, many remain inconclusive, and yet uh, uh, they are guided by the Cotonou Agreement. Will we have another kind of trade arrangement in the post uh, Cotonou Initiative? So how is trade being treated uh, uh, now and uh, beyond uh, 2020? Thank you. Um, it's a very interesting question because as you know, as it as has been already said, uh, the EPAs are in a certain standstill mood uh, in, in uh, their realization. So um, um, there where we have the interim agreements concluded by the um, European Union and certain states of certain regions uh, which has been negotiated, uh, which uh, which have uh, negotiated and concluded in the EPA, um, giving the, the European business a certain access. In the meantime, there is a hope, as I have said already, that with the development of the ASFTA, the the chance for European business to use um, the new phase for 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 having access to the African markets. Um, is a, the, the strategy of the moment. So as there is not yet a, a clear a picture how to deal with the post Cotonou agreement, uh, so what, what will be there, uh, the orientation is trying to use what is existing. Uh, so for example, there is, and I would have introduced it in the later point, um, um, a strategy that the European Union and African countries could work together in promoting a new legislation concerning the um, digital tax um, because there is an understanding that uh, European Union is endangered by the United States that they will sanction European Union if it is really putting the, uh, the big um, tech giants under taxation law. And the same as it is an attempt by African uh, states to introduce a digital tax, um, giving them additional possibilities to get surplus money for dealing with the direct impact of the COVID-19 crisis and to find money there. So here is a, a way of creating a new uh, cooperation form between European Union um, and um, and African countries. So, for example, there is um, um, a new organization um, set up uh, within the frame of the OECD and the African uh, Union to, to, to compose such um, an, 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 a permanent cooperation form um, using, for example, the experience of the South Africa based African Tax Administration Forum. Um, for for uh, forming the African position on that. So, so what I want to express by that is that the EPAs are, of course, uh, still uh, the, 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 the benchmark for the economic cooperation, but there are um, um, searches for, for additional and new forms of, of continuing the cooperation form. And uh, finally, you know, we have four um, free trade uh, agreements negotiated in particular with North African countries. So that is, of course, also one part of the strategy of the European Union. Thank you very much. Uh, in relation to that, uh, there's a question that has come in for Jen. And uh, you are alluding to that the East African community is in the process of preparing its tariff offers. But in the case that uh, economies have been hit uh, badly by uh, COVID, is should there be a review of these offers uh, for every country? Do you think this is a possibility? Then the other question is a more radical one, is uh, how do we stop it all? Maybe you can address this question. Uh, thank you so, so much, Sam. 
and thank you so much um, for those questions. Uh, regarding the ESC tariff offers, uh, in fact, the ESC is also uh, discussing a review of the common external tariff, you know, and the whole issue is that the current uh, um, common external tariff is not effective in protecting certain products. And th th those are the processes we are talking about, which are also mitigating against negotiations in the CFTA. Because if the ESC is uh, negotiating among themselves the common external tariff, how then can they go ahead and make offers uh, to the Africa Union? So it's true, the COVID pandemic has raised a number of realities and there is a need to review. So, so that means that it's important for countries to go slow when they are making their offers, tariff offers uh, to the Africa Union to first of all, rethink liberalization within their regional economic groupings. And this is what in a way uh, the, the ESC, the ESC is doing. Um, another question was, how do we do end it all? That's what you were asking. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, it's a radical question, but like I pointed out that the CFTA, it's a tool and we can design it the way we want. We meaning Africans, you know, it's just a tool, you know, so, so we, we don't need, we, we need to trade among ourselves, but it's the how, how do we do it? And I also want to go to the issue uh, which uh, Honorable Helmut has raised, that the relationship should go beyond just commercial interests. Um, I was looking at the protocol because when they launched the CFTA, there was also the protocol for the free movement of people. But to date, only 27 signed the, that protocol, signed but not, not ratified, you know? So, so we need to look at a relationship which goes beyond commercial interests as um, Helmut has, has pointed out, you know? And we need to look at how we integrate our production. That's the issue which Sira has raised. How do we integrate our, our production? So, so, and that goes to the question, um, uh, Sam, you have raised, how do we deal with the hegemonies? You know, if we can be able to flip it, you know, look at production before we liberalize extensively. We can be able to deal with the hegemonies, we can be able to end this whole um, treadmill of liberalization, you know? My, my submissions on these two issues. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you very much. You have pointed out about uh, uh, the trade agreement going beyond just trade. And I would like to indulge uh, Ndongo on this. Uh, someone is asking which uh, process, which trade process is more important for Africa? Where should it focus? Which is more important? There are EPAs, the Africa Free, uh, free Continental Free Trade Area. Then, of course, uh, in East Africa, like Kenya, it is has opened up negotiations with the United States and and, and, and Britain. Where should we focus? Dongo, please. Have a go. I think um, uh, the focus should be to uh, put an end to the colonial legacy of primary specialization. That means that African countries have to try to increase their domestic production, their domestic capabilities, and at the same time diversify their production and exports. Uh, I am not advocating autarky, but we know uh, from history that uh, all the countries that industrialize, all the countries that develop, they have a phase where they uh, protected their infant industries and allow for industrial development. Uh, what is important for Africa is to have a kind of uh, economic and 
uh, economic and commercial trade integration, which will maximize, let's say, domestic policy space. But in the case of the African continental free trade area, it's a kind of integration which will, let's say, reduce the domestic space. And um, I think this will not uh, be a good thing for economic development and also for, for democracy. Uh, the professor, uh, Daniel Rodrigue, has a very um, telling formula. He's speaking about um, a trinity of impossibility, meaning there is there are three things you could not have at the same time. You couldn't have a nation state, democracy, and deep economic integration. You have to choose two among these three. If you want the nation state and deep economic integration, like for example, the AFCFTA, uh, so you will be uh, in a situation of, let's say, um, uh, where uh, the world economy will dominate your economy and you will have no democracy. So this will give rise to populism, etc. Uh, in his uh, way of uh, framing things, if you want to have the democracy and deep economic integration, you need something like um, a federal structure. Uh, if countries are not ready for federal structure, so they, they need some form of, uh, let's say, protection uh, and not deep economic inter integration. So we have to be clear about, about what, what we want. I think there are many possible things we, want, we can do. If we want to increase trade, we have to increase first production. And we could increase our production by having, for example, the appropriate uh, financial systems. In many countries, the SMEs are not funded at all because they are not the appropriate uh, financial structures. Uh, at the same time, we know that um, uh, the payment systems uh, within Africa are not working. We could have a payment system which will facilitate uh, cross-border trade. Uh, we could also build infrastructures which will help also the flow of, uh, of goods. Uh, there are some studies by the AMF uh, which show that uh, uh, the impact uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, creating uh, infrastructures for trade are uh, higher than, for example, the, what is expected from just removing tariff and non-tariff barriers. There are many things we could do which will help African integration at the same time enlarging domestic space. But unfortunately, that's not the case with the uh, AFCFTA. Uh, thank you on, uh, for, for, for your response. But also maybe if you could also add a little bit, to, uh, a little bit on uh, your work on currencies how does it play in within the africa uh, africa continent of free trade area especially the okay. thank you i will uh, um, give just two aspects the first aspect is about the um, um, the exchange rates uh, in all standard uh, trade models uh, the exchange rates are supposed to be flexible when you have a trade deficit uh, this trade deficit uh, will be uh, will come to equilibrium through flexible exchange rates. In reality, we know it doesn't function like that, but this is a standard assumption. If you want to benefit from free trade, you have to have at least a flexible exchange rate. For the countries using the CFA franc, 14 of them, uh, their exchange rates is back to the, to, to the euro. So they cannot use the exchange rate to absorb shocks. And that means that, for example, in, in West Africa, all the countries using the CFA franc except for Cote d'Ivoire, which is an uh, agricultural rich uh, country, all the other countries have structural trade deficits. That means within the framework of the AFCFTA, their trade deficits will explode and this will create, let's say, uh, more problem for their balance of payments, including more debt. But these aspects are not taken into account by standard trade models. The other aspect is about the financing of um, uh, of, uh, let's say, SMEs and uh, domestic activity. If you take, for example, the case of Guinea-Bissau, a small country, the volume of credit to the private sector is less than what the central banks, central bank of West Africa uh, gives as credit to its own staff. They have a staff of 3,000 and uh, 3,000 more or less. And Guinea-Bissau has an economy of 2 million people. The, the private sector of Guinea-Bissau receives less credit than uh, 3,000 people from, from, from the central bank. That means that if Guinea-Bissau uh, liberalizes its trade, Guinea-Bissau will be destroyed because there is no funding for, for, for production. And this, is also, this also applies for in many parts uh, throughout the continent. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting on that. Uh, we have a question in, I think it will be the last question to our panelists. 
and it goes to Honorable Helmut. It's a simple but very complex question. Is your view, your view, your perspective about the vision of EU-Africa relations, especially uh, one that maintains African policy space? Uh, please go ahead. I say thank you so much. I don't know exactly if it is an easy question, it's, but uh, surely it's a very complex question and uh, I can't speak for Europe. Uh, so I can only express certain reflections about what, what is on the stake and what we have to, to, to think in this direction. And probably we, we have to agree that the relationship between the, between the European Union, which is not Europe, and African uh, countries uh, also very different and, and, and full um, variety is one of the central challenges for the future. How we are living together and that we are stopping to treat people in, 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 at the African continent as uh, cheap labor, as um, uh, those who are supplying us with, with raw materials, etc. So if we don't, I, I would say, together, European Union and the African countries, within the African Union, let it be even, even in the AFC, FTA, to think what are our crucial global challenges for both of us, and let's try to, to, to establish a, a linkage between uh, us uh, to, 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 to answer these challenges, we will not have a future for this relationship, a productive one, a constructive one, a progressive one. So how we are mitigating uh, the loss of biodiversity, how we are dealing with the climate change issues. So what is the energy policy? Because African people also want to have uh, a supply power supply in the wall and then uh, take it the energy so that as a human right to have um, clean water to have a waste treatment etc so these are normal expectations of citizens in our society which we have to answer and that must be done together as i would say because we have to reflect what does it mean environment uh, um, protection what does it mean for for, um, for reducing the CO2 emissions and probably as soon as possible, uh, even better. Um, and uh, in this way, I think we have a lot of uh, common and, 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 and a joint uh, task to deal with it. And that we have to put into the focus also of the commercial, of the economic, of the financial, monetary, uh, as well as of the political cooperation. And maybe this should be mark the future of, of agreements we are concluding together. So for example, the European Union has in its uh, trade agreements always a sustainable development chapter included. Human rights, environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera, social uh, aspects. But they are teethless because there is no concluding uh, um, uh, chat, uh, a tool in these chapters, which is uh, if there is a, a violation of these aims uh, put into the agreements to, the, uh, to those who are committing these, uh, the, that, that they are not realized. And here I see the responsibility of us, in particular in the European Parliament. So we are striving to put into the real, real economic practices of today chapters uh, of, uh, for sustainable development which have a mandatory obligation structure for economic stakeholders that the corporations have to stick to that what is uh, said by the legal uh, representatives uh, by, uh, by those who are uh, who are trying to frame the market to limit the, the, the power of the market and I think here here we have uh, to think together and maybe one conclusion of our workshop would be that we are organizing really um, a chapter by chapter a comparison what has been good and bad in the in the development of the integration process in Europe which is in the capital society uh, uh, shaped but 
it was also shaped under conditions to overcome the tragedy of the Second World War. So this, this, this peace issue, which has already um, shortly discussed in the morning, has given, should give us um, um, a point, a paragraph, where we have to say, yes, how the, the, uh, the economic cooperation between very different African countries within the, the African Union and within the ASFTA um, to, to find ways that there will be peace in the future. So how to establish it by very different expectations by citizens in the different countries. So that is one experience we have in the European Union and let's now talk about what is correct in the way of how the integration process was organized and where had been the biggest mistakes. The, the, the dependence from economies from different countries has, of course, contributed that within the European Union, uh, in the European community of steel and coal, there was a common interest not to lash war against each other because our economies are interlinked. So, so what does it mean under today's conditions for the African start, states? So where we have such an issue, and of course the left in Europe is very much also in discussion about um, in, in which direction we should uh, organize a further integration process. So what is the future of the European Union? How we have to reshape the treaties to give a more social or a social um, face to the European policies in the interest of each citizen. Uh, what we are creating for giving them access to education, for um, uh, for healthcare, etc. In particular, in the, in the situation today when people are affected by the COVID-19 crisis, and suddenly everybody is uh, is uh, realizing yes, the state has a role and he, he has to take care of, um, for for the healthcare system for everybody. So I mean. Uh, these are experience of citizens and we should include the citizens' readiness to participate in shaping their societies in dealing with their e expectations and our wisdom to find new uh, ways and answers. I think this would be the, the main task for the future um, 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 relationship between the European Union and the African continent as such, but of course that is very concrete and precise for each African uh, country because South Africa is, uh, is far uh, not the same as Mali or, uh, or Burundi, etc. etc. So, I mean, we have to find new ways, but we should find the common points in, in, in the challenges ahead of us and here to, to, to deepen the cooperation. I don't know exactly if that is a question, uh, the answer to the question, but I would, I would always argue in that direction to, 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 to find new ways of cooperation um, among us. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Scholz. Maybe in the following webinar, this is part of the questions we shall be addressing. Uh, we have come to the end, but I'll give a few minutes to Honorable Eva Schreiber to wrap it up, maybe two minutes, and then we can end the webinar. Honorable Schreiber, please uh, give your wrap up. Ja, herzlichen Dank. Ich bedanke mich für die spannende Diskussion und die, vor allen Dingen die gute Kooperation zwischen Akteuren und Institutionen, zumindest drei Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftungsbüros, Seatini, Linksfraktion im Europaparlament und mein Büro, das sind ziemlich viele, die sich abstimmen mussten und das hat wunderbar geklappt, finde ich. Also herzlichen Dank dafür. Ja, ich nehme von heute einiges mit. Mein Büro hat sich ja in den letzten Jahren stark mit deutschen Initiativen wie dem Compact with Africa auseinandergesetzt. Das ist und das bleibt auch wichtig, aber wir müssen uns wieder stärker den Handelsfragen zuwenden. Sie stellen sozusagen die Grammatik unserer wirtschaftlichen Beziehungen zu den afrikanischen Ländern dar und der Austausch zwischen unterschiedlichen Partnern und Institutionen, von zivilgesellschaftlichen Organisationen in Kampala bis hin zu Parlamentsbüros in Brüssel. Das ist dafür unerlässlich. 
sowohl für den Austausch von Informationen als auch für die Entwicklung gemeinsamer politischer Strategien. Und wir werden diesen Austausch daher weiterhin suchen und begleiten. Heute in der Diskussion ist sehr deutlich geworden, wie umfassend die Thematik in wirklich alle Lebensbereiche eingreift. Es geht ja eben nicht nur um Handel. Wirtschaft darf nicht nur auf Handel reduziert werden. Wirtschaft ist viel mehr. Es geht um Fragen wie, was wollen wir unter welchen ökologischen und sozialen Bedingungen produzieren? Wie wollen wir es verteilen? Und das ist eine sehr politische Frage, die weit über die Forderung nach Freihandel hinausgeht und ja dieser Forderung in vieler Hinsicht sogar entgegensteht. Und daher müssen wir uns für einen weiten politischen Wirtschaftsbegriff einsetzen. Und gerade deshalb ist es unumgänglich, die Diskussionen zu begleiten, auch mit der nötigen Kritik und diese entsprechend formulieren und in unsere Parlamente bringen. Denn die Politik muss Gestaltungsmacht gegenüber der Wirtschaft zurückgewinnen. Dongo hat darauf hingewiesen, dass politische Integration nicht der wirtschaftlichen folgen darf, sondern Politik. Politik muss die wirtschaftliche Integration in die richtigen Bahnen leiten, zum Beispiel durch durchdachte panafrikanische Industriepolitik. Helmut Scholz hat zudem ganz, ganz wichtig gefordert, dass sich Handelsabkommen an der Erfüllung der SDGs orientieren müssen. Ganz kurz, wir müssen für das Primat der Politik einstehen und kämpfen. Und wir müssen immer wieder darauf drängen, dass die Bevölkerung, die Zivilgesellschaft nicht gegenüber den Konzernen zurückstehen, sondern eine tragende Stimme bekommen. Ich hoffe auf einen weiterhin sehr regen Austausch, bedanke mich noch einmal und auf Wiedersehen und bis zum nächsten Webinar. Danke. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank all, you then. very much, Honorable Schreiber. I will. Yes, thank you very much, Honorable Schreiber. I will end it here. Yes, uh, for we shall have more webinars. We are preparing more webinars. There are many questions that have not been answered. We, we shall answer them in the next uh, sessions that we shall have. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending and for your comments and questions. Be safe. Thank you very much.